There's nothing like it. The human heart beating there in front of you, uh, and then to stop it and fix something, and then have it restart, is always the most uh, wonderful sensation. And a little bit of it is being an adrenaline junkie. In the old days, for sure, less so now, you weren't always sure that heart was going to start again. So there was always a, an unknown, and that was the thrill-seeking uh, nature of the early days of cardiac surgery. My wife, who was a pediatric cardiology fellow at the time, came to the operating room once to watch a, uh, a operation on a child. Came back and said, who's that new resident? He, he's the best guy I've ever seen in the operating room. Said, that's a medical student. <laughs> that's Craig Miller. You know, he grew up in Reading, so he really is a cowboy. That's not an affectation. He is truly a cowboy, you know. And, and so there are pictures of him sitting on a horse, you know, reading a book in the middle of the forest. <laughs> it's like, that captures Craig perfectly, right? <laughs> we had ranches all over Northern California, Southern Oregon, Northern Nevada. And we worked on those ranches, and it was a great way to grow up. Went to a public high school right outside Reading Enterprise High School. The science teachers were really exciting. And I always had a thirst to learn. And so I ended up at Dartmouth. And uh, it was a bold, brand new, different, weird world to this cowboy from Northern California. Well, I met him as a medical student. Uh, I was a resident at that time. Uh, and there were two things about him. One, he was an extremely bright and talented medical student. He was the most surgically adept medical student I had ever seen on the service. Uh, at the same time, he was a little wild and crazy. And uh, particularly uh, the boss, uh, Norm Shumway, uh, wasn't, was, wasn't sure he was ever gonna calm down enough to, uh, to, to be a heart surgeon. Uh, as time went on, it became clear that, uh, that he, he was going to be a great heart surgeon. Dr. Shumway had done the first successful uh, cardiac transplant in the United States in January of 1968, uh, six months before I arrived, so he was well known, and this was the hot thing then. It was just an electric, exciting time for all of us to realize that uh, any form of cardiac surgery could be that transforming and that uh, notorious in the big world. I was allowed to do whatever I wanted to try. And the attitude then was you cannot be afraid to fail or you're never gonna make breakthroughs in innovation. I got to see the, the research side of Craig and, and the teacher side of Craig. And not so much as a clinical teacher, but really how he mentored people. And sometimes it sounded so rough on his, on his fellows, right? But I think in a way that, okay, just pushed them. But I think the key is this legacy of people you know, that he's imparted his knowledge to and the approach to that will diffuse throughout cardiac surgery, probably for, for the foreseeable future, he will have that impact. He has a great relationship with his patients. He actually talks to them, explains things to them so they can understand what he might do and why. He is so dedicated to his patients, and he's so honest with his patients um, that his patients all love him. You know, we joke a little bit about Craig because even though he's sort of thought of as a pioneer, okay, he's also very careful. He's really been able to you know, push the art of cardio, cardiac surgery, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a wonderful way. Craig was one of the few cardiac surgeons who not only had some grant support, but had a lot of grant support. And that was because his work was scientifically rigorous. You know, he was a real surgeon scientist. There aren't many. And having, you know, un unbroken NIH support for 30 years is extremely unusual for surgeons. I worked with him a lot in his lab, and so he, uh, at that point, 
was very much into mitral valve. Obviously, he, you know, uh, he was one of the first surgeons who really uh, advocated mitral valve repair, and he was one of the leaders on that. Yeah, you want to be the guy to do it first, right? Okay, but the key is you want to be the guy who does it first and do it right. And, and that's really what defines Craig. He's done so many firsts, right? The valve sparing, mitral repair, uh, involvement with the uh, T-bar, so transcatheter over stent grafts for uh, thoracic aneurysms. He was certainly a big part of what got the TAVR program going here at Stanford, the transcatheter aortic valve program. And if you looked around the, the, the world and the country, okay, um, Stanford was on the map for doing those, and that's because of Craig. Craig always wanted to know what happened to his patients five, 10, 20 years later, and whether his his contributions, his way of doing things, was doing people good or not. Uh, and he preached that to all of our colleagues, not just in aortic surgery, but in heart surgery in general. He was one of the first people to develop databases, to follow patients. Craig was very vocal, very passionate about it. He started publishing even, I, as I recall, before we graduated. but. And he is uh, uh, published all the way along, uh, which, as you can imagine, is, is not necessarily a priority for a lot of heart surgeons. The human interaction coupled with the science that drew me to medicine. But I thought the, the my scientific yearnings and background uh, would be great to apply to why the heart beats. and. and and cardiac function, cardiac mechanics, why the valves work as well as they do. And that was most of my research career. And one of the early things I saw was uh, the way we were handling mitral valve disease. And that led to the concept of not cutting everything out, but actually leaving what God put there. So if you left what nature put there, even if you had to replace the valve, the patients did better. The folks with Marfan syndrome have always been dear to me, and Dr. Shumway had a lot of Marfan's patients, and, and in the 70s, we had finally come up with an operation to fix their aneurysms before they ruptured. The average life expectancy was in the mid-30s, and most of them would die of aneurysm rupture or aortic dissection. And Craig was one of the initial individuals in the field who understood the importance of trying to work out an operation where you could get the aorta out of there, which is a weak structure and which kills most people with Marfan. But for the average patient with Marfan syndrome now, uh, with the advances in aortic surgery, the lifespan is approaching normal. My wife, Sandy, has supported me incredibly for 40 years and uh, is the reason I have been able to do this, but I couldn't have done this without her. And uh, she's been there through thick and thin. So Craig is a wonderful recipient for the, uh, for the Sterling Lifetime Achievement Award in medicine. He exemplifies all the things that make a great academic clinician. Uh, he's been a wonderful teacher with a long legacy of wonderful trainees who have been imparted with his wisdom and his approach to life and medicine. And he's done uh, you know, very, very pioneering work in how the mitral valve and the left ventricle works. He's been a pioneer in new techniques that have saved lives and improved quality of life. And he's impacted so many lives with his care. You know, patients love him. They come back to see him. They send him pictures of, his ba of their babies. You know, he becomes a part of their life forever. He's a Stanford product through and through. And uh, someone we're all proud to know and you know, proud to be associated with. Being recognized by the school to receive the, the Wallace Sterling Award is a huge surprise, number one, very humbling, number two, and is a great honor. The school has produced some great people who have done tremendous things. And it's been because of the don't be afraid to fail attitude that I osmosed when I was a student here and hopefully continues. <laughs>